the word Noel has several meanings. Most notably, it communicates the news of God's goodness and love expressed through the birth of His Son, Jesus Christ. In this three-part Christmas series, we'll discover why the birth of the Savior is indeed good news and why we have reason to sing and celebrate this Christmas season. Amen. Welcome to The Rock. I'm Bill. Hey, I just want to say, I, I kind of got caught up in that worship. I don't know about you. I, I felt like God was just, yeah, round of applause for the band leading us in worship. I kind of forget some of those Christmas songs, and then it's like, oh my gosh, I just, you can connect emotionally, because I've been singing them for 50 years. And we, I, I get an opportunity from time to time to to speak different places, conferences, or churches. Um, and I want to tell you something. We are so blessed by the, the worship that comes out of this church. The bands, the, the original music. We're going to sing this song, Noel, at the end of, this, of the message here. That's the, the rock music's latest release, and it is fantastic. You got, I, I don't know, some of you, this is all you know. Just take it from me. We are absolutely blessed by the music and the worship at the Rock Church. We are. Yeah, amen. So, like I said, we're, we're starting a brand new three-week series uh, based off of the song, Noel, which, again, we're going to sing at the end. I'm going to look at some of the, the lyrics in the song and talk about that tonight. But before that, uh, I was asked by the pastors and leadership to give you a financial update. It's the end of the year. I know Brent just talked about that. But we have a, a fundraiser going on right now. We're getting to the end. Three weeks left of our Imagine the Possibilities. Here's an update. We, we haven't given you a lot of updates, but just as a reminder, uh, at the beginning of last year, so almost a year ago, the pastors were trying to figure out what we want to see, what, what we want to believe God for this next year. So all of 2024, which is quickly coming to an end. We decided, hey, wouldn't it be amazing if we could kill the debt Leave 2024 debt-free. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be a miracle. Um, what about adding a west patio, uh, a place, a third space where we could hang out, have heaters, have seats, have benches, and then we badly need to upgrade some of the sound equipment. So we kind of threw it all together and we thought, we'll just ask the church. We'll just throw it out. It was a very low-key, low-pressure ask. It was just like, if God, you know, if you want to join this, great. If not, we trust the Lord. So here's the update. Um, so we asked for $615,000. That was what we came up with for all those things. So far, we've got $209,000, which, by the way, is awesome. It could look bad, but it's like, you know, we came up with the six hundred fifteen. dollars God said, no, I'm going to give you about $200,000, which I think is fantastic. That you guys gave over $200,000 more than your regular giving. So that was our goal. So we came up short of that by about $405,000. And that's, again, not... A big deal. Because we were just, we said, let's just see what happens. Let's do this. God knew what we needed. So we got about 34% of that, which I, again, I say is awesome. Okay. So we're not going to be able to do the sound stuff. We're not going to be able to put a, wet, a patio out yet. Although here's the deal. I've had so many people. We have gifted, skilled construction workers, construction company owners that have big equipment, that have the skills, can get us permits. And they're all saying, hey, I want to help. And we have so much skilled labor in here. We just don't have the cash to buy the materials. Otherwise, we just go do it. So I just want to let you know, as soon as we get the money, we'll do, we can do stuff like that. Because we have the people that can do it. Okay? So here's what I want to encourage you with, all right? That could seem discouraging. It's not. Let's, let's forget about sound equipment in the patio for right now. Let's just talk about the debt. Because to, to us, that was the main thing. The, the vision of going debt-free at the end of the year, going into 2005 with no debt on this building, would be incredible. So we were given $209,000, and we would need $440,000 to be able to pay off the debt at that point last year, okay? So we applied that, you know, if you apply all that, $209,000, just to pay off the debt, we still have about $400,000, nope, that's not the right number. Let me go to this slide because it was supposed to get changed. We have in the slot there $230,000 left to meet the goal so that we could pay off the building. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, here's our current situation with our building. 
Last year, at this time, a year ago, 12 months ago, we owed $1.136 million on this building. Okay, we built it 10 years ago, um, and we still owe $1.136 million. And that's what we were saying as pastors, wouldn't that be amazing just to get rid of that? To pay off a million dollars, $1.3 million in one year. Um, with uh, the money that came in this year, there was some extra money at different times. Brent would apply that to our mortgage. He just started to pay it off. Everything that came in that we could, we put toward the mortgage because we really want to pay this off. And if you add the $209,000 in that came in through the campaign, we have that uh, number down to $792,000. That's still a big number, but it's way better than $1.3 So right now, that's where we sit. I just want to share something with you that this has been an amazing year, and we have spent a lot of money this year. I'll just say that. We've spent a lot of money. We had a lot of things going on. Our 25-year celebration, we just said, you know what? God is a God of celebration. That's a big deal. We're going to go whole hog. We're just going to just make it all, all awesome. So that costs a lot of money. Uh, we did four international mission trips, helping uh, support, not pay completely for it, but 52 people. We supported going out on mission, and you supported. Mission to the City, uh, TRM released seven new songs. We upgraded some of the equipment, like some of these uh, the, uh, projectors, which are honking expensive, $10,000 a piece. We had to upgrade those. Um, women's retreat, men's retreat, we subsidized that heavily, and we gave away $175,000. So, yes, that's what I said. We gave away $175,000 as a church to people and organizations outside of our church. Why? Because we want to follow your example of being generous. You're generous. We're going to be generous as a church. So we want to bless other people, even outside of our church and within our church. All that to say, um, so that's where we're at. It would take $792,000 to pay off our debt. Guess what? Pastors have decided that next week we're going to take a check to the bank for $792,000. Because we have some money in the bank that we've been saving. And you add it all together. Here's the deal. Be very honest. We're going to cut into our emergency savings to do this. Because we believe so much that God wants us just to get rid of the debt. And with all your money, the $200,000 you have given, and the extra money you've given, we can do this. Now, we will be exposed a little bit. We don't like not having a, at least a three-month runway of savings. Emergency savings. Our checking account's down lower than it's ever been or been for a long time because of, of the things we spent money on that we planned on spending money on. We planned that. Um, so our emergency savings will be a little bit vulnerable. But we're gonna, we feel by faith this is something we should do. So within next week or the week after that, I, I wanna be, I'm going to be part of it. I told Brent I want to be part of it. We're going to walk a check into the bank for $792,000 and pay this building off. Yeah, amen. Amen. That's a, for a little church like ours, in 10 years to pay. Here's what happened. Look, look what happened. In 10 short years, uh, we bought land, $1.4 million, and we paid for it. It's all paid for. We built a building, $2.6 million, and next week it's all going to be paid for. That's $4 million for our property. Now, here's what's cool. You know, when we decided to build this building like 12 years ago and buy land, we debated, should we rent or should we, should we build? And we built. Had we rented, we would have spent about a million dollars the last 10 years on rent, heat, electricity, all of that. To fix things up, about a million dollars that would have just got thrown away. You know how much this property is worth right now? Uh, $6.8 million if we sold it right now. So I think buying and building was the right decision, don't you? God has been very good to us. So here's, here's all I want to say. Bottom line on this update is that we'll be out of debt in 2025, which makes me just want to smile. And it should make you smile. And the reason is, the reason is because you're so amazingly generous. That's the reason. That's the only reason. And the second thing is that year-end giving is going to be crucial this year because we're going to be vulnerable. It's a bit risky to cut into our emergency savings. So cash-wise, our checking's down so if there's some big emergency, we're not going to be able to cover it, but we're trusting, we trust the Lord. We're not, I'm not trying to scare you. God will take care of us. All that to say, 
a lot of you, for some reason, like to give a lot at the end of the year. I don't know why, but keep doing it. I'll just say that, okay? Because <laughs> you scare us all year long. It's like, man, we're going in the red. And then at the end of the year, we pop out typically. We really need that this year. So maybe you haven't given much. Maybe you haven't given at all. Has the rock blessed you at all? Has this been a blessing to your life at all? Then God would say, take a part of what he's given to you and give it back to him. And this is a good investment, I think, what God's doing right here at the Rock Church. So I just want to say ahead of time, thank you for really digging in this year and making your end of the year giving count. Let's just see what God can do. Let's go into 2026, not in the red, which we are right now, and not vulnerable, but in a strong position to do all that he calls us to do the next year. Amen? God bless. Thank you so much for all that you do to give. Yes, give God a round of applause. I'm excited. I'm excited about being out of debt. I'm telling you. I think that's awesome. All right. Yes, we are starting the series called Noel, three-part series. And uh, tonight I'm going to talk about, well, let's talk about what Noel means because I had to look it up and kind of research it. Basically, from Latin and French, it means to be born and then a different phraseology in the French means Merry Christmas, but basically it communicates the news of God's goodness and his love expressed through the birth of his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, it's associated with a joyous celebration of Christmas. Joyous celebration. So when you sing Noel at the, in the last song, that's what it means. And today, uh, I want to talk about part one, Jesus is born. We'll talk about reasons that the birth of Jesus is reason to be joyful and to celebrate. And why it is good news. The Bible tells us it's good news. Right there at the beginning, Luke 2.10. But the angel said to the shepherds, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for how many people? All people. The birth of Jesus is for all people, and it's news that is good. <laughs> it is joyful news. And again, singing the hymns tonight is just like, it is joyful. It's so good to be reminded. All the things we sang tonight relate to what I want to say today. God becoming a man has changed the entire world. I want to illustrate that to you tonight, that, that God changed the world by becoming a man. Uh, think about that. Who could have imagined, right, the impact? I mean, babies are born all the time. Who could have imagined the impact of a baby being born 2,024 years ago in a small, insignificant, dusty, Middle Eastern village in Palestine? This baby is born in a stable, and the world has never been the same has never been the same. There are over 2 billion people on this planet right now that claim to be Christ followers of that little baby that grew up to be a man. The impact has still been felt all over our world. I mean, try going shopping even now. Stores are full now. Go to the mall now. We're still about three weeks out. And, and there's long lines at the checkout. Traffic is getting more crowded. Um, Stores are packed out. Churches are filling up. Amazon drivers are getting overtime. I mean, it's changing the whole world right now. This little baby born in Palestine. One of the best benefits of Christmas time, of course, every year is that the McRib is back. <laughs> I've had one. Anybody had a McRib yet? It's back. Don't miss it. It's going to go away again. Christmas. Oh, we love Christmas. You know, again, realize, just think about how much Jesus changed the world at that little baby. He actually split our timeline that the world goes by from B.C. to A.D. That, that, what is the line in between is that baby being born. From that point on, our whole timeline of the entire world changed. And we base it on Jesus' birth. Think about that. Every time you write a check, you attest and you affirm the fact that this baby was born and changed the world every single time. So I ask you again, how is it good news that this baby was born? What difference does it make to you tonight? Why should it matter to you? 
Why is it good news? I want to look at four or three reasons, actually. The reason Jesus' birth was good news. So let's bow our heads one more time. Would you pray with me? Lord, we, we come to you tonight and we ask that you would... Wait a minute, I just want to remember, God, that who we're talking to. We're talking to that child, that, that baby that was born, who became a man who's been God from the very beginning. We're talking to you right now. That is so cool. You're alive. You're not dead. You're not a baby anymore. You are God Almighty. You're the King of Kings. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. And we talk to you tonight as friends, and we ask you, right now in 2024, that you would show up here through your Holy Spirit. Teach us. Help us. Help us lock into the fact that you became a man and what that means and why that's good news. And I pray that if there's people here that don't know you tonight, they would, they would choose you tonight. Tonight would be their night. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, three reasons. You have a handout. You can pull it out and follow along. That Jesus' birth is good news, number one. It's because God became a man. That's why it's good news. God Almighty became a man. Now, it can be hard to comprehend really what happened. We, we can think about that, but it doesn't make any difference it's, it, because it's just white noise. It's like, oh yeah, God became a baby. You know, that's not insignificant. That's not a small thing that happened. That's not unremarkable that God invaded this planet. But, but it can be, if we don't think about it, if we don't snap out of it and go, wait a minute, what does that really mean? And think deeply about the fact that God, the Creator, became a man, became a baby. It's almost too much to even comprehend, isn't it? But we do well to think about it. <laughs> In the song we're going to sing, Noel, which this series is based on, I have some lyrics here love incarnate love divine star and angels gave the sign bow to babe on bended knee savior of humanity there's a lot in there but i think about what it means that jesus came to this planet that's what it means when it says incarnate um we're told in matthew 123 the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him emmanuel which means what it means what Emmanuel, that baby is called Emmanuel, which means, oh my goodness, God with us. God, God is with us in that baby. That's what happened. God became a baby? What? John Stott, theologian, said the fact that God became a man is the most wondrous truth. The Creator entered His creation. And this is the core of our faith. It is the core of our faith that God became a man, became one of us. In fact, Jesus became the incarnation that we sing about, that we talk about, that the Bible talks about. Incarnation. In Colossians 1, 15-16, it says, Jesus Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. He, listen, about Jesus, about this baby, he existed before God made anything at all. And in fact, Christ himself is the creator who made everything. That baby, in that package, that little baby, is God who made everything. And I can't, I can't really wrap my brain around this, so I start thinking about it. It's just who I am. Um, I like to think about, I, I, I try to somehow get a visual picture of what that would be like. So let me just do that just for a second. I can go into greater detail than I have in the past, but I want you to think about our planet, just our planet, how big it is, how massive it is. Imagine somebody so strong they could go out and they can grab the grass, they can lean down, grab the grass, and they can flip the earth over and they're holding it, you know, like Atlas. See? Man, you just imagine how much weight and how big that would be. It's, what, 7,900 miles in diameter. A lot of it just solid rock and granite. The, the earth is, you can't comprehend how big the earth is. 
But, and God made it. Jesus made it. That baby created this planet and all the birds and the stars and the, and the grass and the fish and the whales and the elephants and the monkeys and, and all the insects and all the microbes. He made it all. And He made this planet. But this planet isn't the biggest thing out there. I mean, just think about our sun. How big our sun is. You realize if you hollowed out our sun hollowed it out like a big old hot pumpkin, and you started taking our big planet and you dropped it inside the sun, do you realize you could put 1.3 million of our Earths inside that star, inside our sun? You think the Earth is big, but then you go, wait a minute, it's, it's nothing compared to how big the sun is. I mean, that's got to be the biggest star out there, isn't it? No, not even close. There's a star called V.Y. Canis Majoris. You see where the sun is there? I had to cheat to make it so you could see it. It's just a little pixel, and it's bigger than it should be. See, V.Y. Canis Majoris, if you hollowed it out like a pumpkin, you could drop 6.4 times 10 to the 15th of our suns, which each hold 1.3 million of our Earths inside that star. And Jesus made them all with the breath of his mouth. That baby was the creator who made that. And he became a baby. Look at this verse. Psalm 33. It says, The Lord merely spoke. Jesus merely spoke. And the heavens were created. It wasn't even hard for him. He just breathed out. And all the heavens were created. He breathed the word. And all the stars were born. Let everyone in the world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. Who did that? That baby. He was God and he became a baby. Wrapped up in a baby. Became a man and died. Jesus did all that. Yet he became a baby. It's, un, it's so remarkable. C.S. Lewis said, Once in our world, a stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. The eternal God took on humanity and dwelt among us. Incarnation. Jesus became the incarnation. It's the act of being made flesh or having flesh put on. Um, John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Who's that talking about? Who's the Word that became flesh? Jesus. Yeah, it, was, it says Jesus later on in that chapter. It was Jesus that put on flesh. God put on flesh. Flesh literally, I mean, incarnation literally means to put on flesh or meat. It's like when you order a taco carne, con carne. Give me a taco con carne. It's going to be something with meat. If it's chili con carne, it's going to be chili with meat. Incarnation means meat. God put on meat. He put on flesh and become one of us. That's what incarnation means. Max Ocado says, God with skin on. That's how significant the birth of Jesus is. It's God choosing to be among us and live alongside of us. And I want to illustrate this. I do this most years, but for some of you who have never seen it, I think it could change your whole perspective on Christmas. I want to illustrate the fact that Jesus became one of us. And that is not insignificant. The God of the universe who created all those stars came to this planet and became one of these. This is Addie Dawes. This is what your God did for you. The one who made all those stars that you can't even count came in a form like this, chose to come in a vulnerable, scary form of a little baby. Scary for him, not for us. The God who made everything. The God who gives you breath. The God who's every, to, to who, whose name every knee will bow and every tongue confess came as a little baby. 
Why do you think he did that? Why do you think he would do that? I, I think there's one reason I think about is that no one is intimidated by a baby. God wants you to know you can come to him. He's available. He's approachable. You don't have to be intimidated. I could be intimidated by maybe people in political power or big movie stars or sports stars. I can be intimidated, but I'm never intimidated by a baby. Does she intimidate you? You want to squeeze her. God came as one of these. Never forget that. Never forget that. Thank you. Give Addie a round of applause here. She did so good. Here's our second reason Jesus' birth is good news. First, he became a man. He became the incarnation, God with flesh. Second, he became our Savior. And, and Savior isn't just some title. You're a monarch of whatever. Or you're this, you're a doctor of this. It, it's not Jesus Christ is my Savior. Is, that's not some title. He's Savior because he saved something. And that something is you and me. That's why we call him a Savior. Not just as a title. Yeah, Jesus is my Savior. Is he? He is the Savior. And we read in the song Noel, Son of God and Son of Man, there before the world began, born to suffer, born to save, born to raise us from the grave. Timothy Keller said, The birth of Jesus is the beginning of the world's hope. God did not simply give us a teacher, but a Savior who would redeem us from the darkness. Jesus, in fact, was born to suffer and die. Some people feel like Jesus dying on the cross was a terrible tragedy. In, in one sense, I understand that, but it's unfortunate that he had to die on the cross. We wish he hadn't. Men and women, you've got to realize that's why he came. It's the only way he could save us. It's the only way he could be the Savior. In Mark 8, 31, we're told, And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man, talking about himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. Jesus went around telling people, you're going you're to reject me, and then you're going to kill me. But I'm going to rise on the third day. That's what he was telling people while he was on the earth. He came to die. That was his purpose. It wasn't just that he was a good teacher. He was a good teacher. It wasn't just that he was a prophet. He was a prophet. He came to be your Savior because you needed saving, and I needed saving. I've got a lot of good quotes tonight. John Piper says, The true miracle of Christmas is that, the, is that God sent his Son into the world, not just to be born, but to die for our sins. And to give us life. And then Billy Graham says, The very purpose of Christ coming into the world was that he might offer up his life as a sacrifice for the sins of men. He came to die. That's why he came. This is the heart of Christmas. This Christmas, as we think about the baby that was born in the cradle, let's not forget that that baby grew up and died. That was his purpose. He had to. In fact, Jesus was called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming toward him, when Jesus was just beginning his ministry, it says this, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now you and I, that might not mean much, but to us, a society, a system, a religion that was still sacrificing a lamb every day, for the sins of the people of Israel at three in the afternoon, taking a perfect sinless lamb and sacrificing it, killing it for the sins of the people. That meant something when John said, look, the lamb of God, pointing at Jesus, who takes away the sins, not just of Israel, but of the entire world. That lamb. They understood what he was talking about when he called Jesus a lamb. You see, when they picked a lamb, it had to be spotless. It had to be innocent. It had to be pure. And they, they slayed it every day, the daily sacrifice at 3 p.m. at Temple Mount. They slayed the lamb. 
to pay for the sins, to cover the sins one more day for the people of Israel. And we're told in Isaiah and in Jeremiah that the Messiah, they were prophesying about Jesus, the Messiah would be led to the, to the slaughter like a lamb. That's what the, was going to happen to the Messiah. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I like what this website, I love this website, by the way, you should check it out, gotquestions.org. The whole sacrificial system established by God in the Old Testament set the stage for the coming of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrifice God will provide as atonement for the sins of his people. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And just like Cole mentioned earlier, there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. There's no forgiveness, according to the Bible, without the shedding of blood. And I want you to think about this. You guys remember the old movie, Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston? Anybody seen the old, timey version? Yeah, yeah, I want to watch that again. I think it depicts this scene very well, where the angel of death, the night before the Israelites were released from Egypt, after 400 years of captivity, the angel of death came down and killed the firstborn of everyone in Egypt. All firstborn were killed of humans and animals. And God told Moses to warn the Israelites that this was going to happen. And he said, here's how you protect yourself. You take some blood of a lamb, an innocent animal, you slay it and you get the blood and you wipe it around your doorposts and the frame of your door. Put the blood around and then go inside and do not come out. And anyone that comes out will be slain. That night, the angel of death, we're, we're told in Exodus, comes down. And in the movie, it's, it's like it comes down as creepy green smoke. It's really kind of creepy. Like, Ooh, and the smoke is going around, looking at everybody's door. And what I love about this is if you look inside, if you watch the movie, you'll see people have all kinds of different reactions because all of a sudden people are screaming. They can hear their neighbors screaming like their kids are getting killed. Their firstborns are dying right all around them. Some people inside of Moses' house there are freaking out, like, no, we're going to get killed too. Other people are singing songs. Other people are almost falling asleep, some of the older ones. And there's some actually slaves from Ethiopia that are in there. They're not even Israelites. A whole different group of people, a, whole, a variety of people. Yet when the angel of death comes down, it doesn't look inside and go, which ones have been good this year? Which ones have been nice? Which ones have followed my laws? Which ones are freaking out? Which ones are trusting me? No, the angel of death only looked at what? The blood. If it saw the blood, it says the angel of death passed over. That's where they get the Passover meal. Every year, even now, Jews celebrate the Passover. The angel of death looked for the blood. That's all it cared about. That's all God cares about today. Are you, my friends, covered by the blood? The blood of Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That child that was born and raised into a man and died for your sins to cover you with the blood. It says in Hebrews, like we said, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Are you covered by the blood tonight? Or are you trying to earn your way to heaven? God's not looking at that. He's looking at the blood. Are you trusting in the blood? Here's the third Big point, last point. First, Jesus is good news because he became a man. Then he became a savior, the Lamb of God. And now it's good news because God became our redeemer. He became our redeemer. He bought us with his blood. In the song Noel, we're going to sing, Christ, the everlasting Lord. Lord means king, savior. You're the one I worship. That's Jesus, that little baby. He shall sing forevermore the story of amazing love, the light of the world given for us. God became our Redeemer. He bought us. He redeemed us. And we'll talk about that word. He redeemed us with His blood. He died and rose to redeem us from the grave, as the song says earlier. Romans 3.24 says, We are justified freely by His grace through the what? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through the redemption. We are justified freely by His grace through redemption. Jesus didn't just snap His finger and say, Oh, everybody come on into heaven. No, He had to purchase us with His blood. 
He redeemed. It's by grace, but it comes through a cost. Redemption means to buy out, to purchase freedom. And when, when we get purchased, then, then we are no longer in bondage to sin. When we become Christ, when He buys us with His blood, and we receive the gift that He offers, we submit ourselves to His Lordship, He redeems us, and our chains are broken. Charles Stanley says, Jesus came to redeem us from the grave so we could live with purpose now and forever. Death is conquered, and life is is restored. Jesus, I want you to know tonight, is dying to have a relationship with you. He is literally dying to know you. He wants a relationship with you. He's not making it hard. He has already paid the price. If you will receive it, you'll be redeemed. You'll be redeemed from death and hell forever. Your sins can be wiped away and you'll become His child. It's yours for the asking. He wants you to have a relationship with him. With him. He's not stingy, and, and that reminds me of a story I've told a couple times, but I'll tell it again tonight. It reminds me of a, a young boy that was about a week before Christmas, and he was writing Jesus a letter asking for this presence that he so desperately wanted. Sat in his living room with a piece of paper, a little boy, and said, Dear Jesus, I deserve my presence because I've been a good boy for three months. And then he stopped. He looked at it and crossed out three months. He said, Dear Jesus, I've been a good boy for one month. And he sighed and he crossed that out. He said, Dear Jesus, I've been a good boy for a week. And he crossed that out. And he just sat there dejected. Looking down at his table, trying to figure out what to do. And he looked up. And when he looked up, he looked across the room and he saw... Um, what his parents had put up, which is a nativity scene with porcelain figurines. And he, his eyes brightened, and he all of a sudden got an idea, and he w- rushed across the room, and he grabbed the porcelain figure of Mother Mary and brought it back to his desk and put it down in front of him, stared at it, and then got another piece of paper out and started writing. And he wrote, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> you know, here's the deal. We don't have to resort to extortion to get what we need from Jesus. He's given it to us. We just have to receive it. God is not stingy. He's dying to know you. So let me ask you this last question. Have you received God's gift? I wanted to bring a present tonight and hold up a present. Have you received God's gift of salvation, of having your sins forgiven? Have you been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? You should know if you have been. If you don't know, then you probably haven't been. I'll just say that. If you don't know, you probably haven't been. But you can settle that tonight. Have you received it? Romans 6, 23, and it is a gift, by the way, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves. You can't earn it. It is the what? The gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God is offering you a gift tonight, appropriate during the Christmas season. It's the best gift you would ever receive. To be redeemed, to be purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me just mention that you are not here by mistake tonight. I really don't care if somebody drug you in here, kicking and screaming. God has you here. God loves you so much. He brought you here tonight to help you understand that this baby became a man and died. He was God in the flesh. He was perfect. He was innocent. And he was killed. You know what time he was killed? 3 o'clock p.m. Same time that they slay the lambs in Israel. And he died for you. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Has He taken your sins away? He's paid for it, but has He redeemed you? Have you you received this gift? Have you taken the gift from Him? You can. (laughs) You're not here by mistake. And I just hope, and my prayer is, that there won't be another Christmas that goes by without you finally receiving this gift, humbling yourself before God and saying yes to Him, the God who loves you so much that He became one of us and laid his life down for you. We're going to pray in just a minute. 
Uh, but I just want to say this. I, I, I'm sure this is the case that some of you have been maybe close to God in the past. Maybe you felt closer to God than you are right now. That's okay. Christmas time is, is a great time to come back to God. And you can do that as well. Again, he's smiling. You turn back to God, you're going to find out he's smiling at you. He's not mad. He's not angry. He's not indignant. He's smiling. Because that's his heart. He loves you. He wants you to come back. There's not a better time than Christmas. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've been done or have done, no matter your status in life, it doesn't matter. This is the best time. The best time to receive Christ is right now. The best time to do that. And I'm going to give you a chance to do that right now. Tonight can be your night. I'm going to say a prayer. And if it expresses the desires that, that you sense and you understand now, how much God loves you and what he's done for you and he wants to forgive you, if you pray this prayer with me in your heart, then God will hear you. So let's bow our heads right now together. And we'll end with a prayer and then a last song. If that, this is your desire, you can pray something like this quietly in your own heart. You can agree with me when I say, God, I don't want to let another Christmas season pass without accepting your gift to me. Thank you for coming to the earth as a baby so I could know what you're like. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our Redeemer. God, I am truly amazed you would even want a relationship with me. I want to get to know you. I want to learn to trust you. I know I've done a lot of things wrong. I've sinned against you. And I confess my sins to you right now. And ask you to come into my life and forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross, for forgiveness and raising from the dead for my justification. From this day forward, I want you to be Lord of my life. Right now, December 7, 2024. I repent of my sins, and I'm choosing the gift of eternal life that you offer to me. Please come into my heart right now and make me new. Thank you that you've heard my prayer. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Let's keep our heads bowed just for a second. I want to speak to you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to give you a gift right now. Other than the gift you just gave, and, and that's this. If you said yes to Jesus for the first time tonight, I want you to I'm going to give you a gift, and that gift is this. I want you to look up at me. That's the gift. That'll bless your life. If you pray that prayer, look up at me. Don't be embarrassed. Just look up. I'm looking around the room. If you pray that for the first time, look in my eyes. You'll be glad you did this. You're confessing before men that you've trusted Christ. Now I want you to confess before God. If you're looking at me, nobody else is looking, then I want you to raise your hand up real high right now. Don't be embarrassed. Raise it up all around the room. Yes, keep raising it up. If that's you, raise it up. Keep it up. Keep it right there because I just want to gl give glory to God. There's about 10 people that said yes to Jesus Christ. Like, God, that, that's the best gift you guys will ever receive. I'm going to tell you. You can put your hands down. Everybody look up. Give God a round of applause for that. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Just let, just let me say this to be the first to say Merry Christmas to all of you who said yes to Jesus and were brave enough to say I'm stepping it up. I'm, I'm going to, before men, I'm going to say, yes, I did pray that prayer. I did confess my sins to Jesus. That, that is the best decision you've ever made. This is a gift that you'll take to eternity. It won't sit on your shelf. And I know there's questions that you'll have. For some, it's, it's a step closer to Christ. I get that. But here's what I want you to do. On the back of your bulletin, it says, there's a place to check, I receive Christ tonight as my personal Savior. I want you to check that. Put your name on it. We're not going to stalk you, but we're going to send you some resources to help you. We want to help you now. If you need a Bible, go to the Connections. we got a Bible for you. Take that filled out form to the Connections booth and just hand it to them and say, I prayed this prayer tonight. They will help you. This is what we're all about. This is what we do. This is what we want. I've given my life to this. And so have so many of the people at The Rock. We love the fact that you responded to the call of Jesus tonight. We're so thankful and grateful. For the rest of us, God bless you guys. We're going to sing Noel, which is the whole point of this whole series. So we're going to sing it loud. This is a great song. God bless you guys. Have a good night.